Good morning, everybody. My name is Danny Giddings, and I am representing the team working on the Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act of 2015. I want to thank you all for being here at our final briefing. I also want to thank my entire team, as well as our advisor, Professor Palmer. So this morning, we're going to start out in the Clark Township. It's located at the heart of Lichenu Watershed on Lake Huron in Michigan, and it is the quintessential small tourist town. Of the township's 2,000 residents, more than 40% make their living from sport fishing and tourism. But the Clark Township has a problem. Over the past few decades, low water levels have provided ripe breeding ground for invasive species such as Phragmites and Eurasian water milfoil. And this is a particular problem because milfoil, for example, clogs waterways and propellers, which affects business and, and recreation along the water. And has a substantial impact on the fishing industry, the sport fishing industry, which is a major revenue generator for the community. These are costly problems. Milfoil can cost up to $26,000 per acre for removal. And with many acres to treat, the community can't keep doing this over and over again uh, on a small municipal budget. However, that number still pales in comparison to the $100 million annually that is spent on, or that invasive species incur in the Great Lakes region. So generally, the problems facing the Great Lakes ecosystems can be simplified into two categories. The first is habitat degradation driven by human development of land and water and aggravated by invasive species, as I just mentioned in the Clark Township example. But the other category we'll talk about this morning is pollution caused by a history of harmful human activity and industrial activity and both urban and agricultural runoff. So in the Great Lakes, non-point source is, sorry, in the Great Lakes, the largest non-point source is agricultural runoff, which contains high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, which non-coincidentally are the two uh, major components of fertilizer. And these nutrients are washed into the Great Lakes through irrigation channels. And an unnatural level of these nutrients in the water feeds algae to grow to harmful levels. When this algae grows to harmful levels, it's what we call an algal bloom. And algal blooms are bad for two reasons. The first being that they deplete oxygen, which results in fish kills, and they also produce toxins. These toxins have been known to kill fish, mammals, and birds, but they're also harmful to humans. So once they reach a certain level in the water, it's not safe for human consumption. Now, that's a particular problem because 26 million people depend on the Great Lakes for drinking water. So any kind of ban has a pretty profound effect. So the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative was started in 2010 in direct response to many of the problems that I have just discussed. Efforts to solve these environmental problems have already achieved substantial success through the initiative, which allocated $1.37 billion to restoration efforts in its first five years. Our bill simply renews this initiative's mandate and authorizes an annual budget of $475 million so that restoration efforts may continue. It also permanently establishes the advisory board which, is, which consists of stakeholders from a broad range of interests, including business, environmental groups, state, local, and tribal governments. It also permanently establishes the Interagency Task Force, which consists of the 11 federal agencies and cabinet departments you see represented on the screen here. These are the agencies and departments that collaborate on restoration in the initiative. So this map shows the spatial distribution of the over 2,500 projects that were already carried out in phase one of the initiative. Notice that they're widely distributed and are developed in a variety of focus areas. So the solution to habitat degradation is to control invasive species, protect native species, and restore native habitats. If we go back to our Clark Township example, because it was so difficult and ineffective to pull milfoil as a means of removal, uh, they decided to launch a biological program in 2007 using a specialist weevil that kills the plant. Now, it was so successful early that they added more, they released more weevils four years later. Inexplicably, after they did this, the milfoil came back stronger than ever. Now, that's 
certainly not because of the weevils. That increase of growth certainly isn't because of the weevils. However, it does demonstrate how biological control isn't a one-shot solution and often needs to be implemented in tandem with things like herbicidal control to be effective. But restoration isn't just about keeping invasive species out. The other side of the coin is rehabilitating and protecting endangered species populations like the Carner Blue butterfly. It, the Carner Blue lives in open forests and grasslands in the Great Lakes region, but due to habitat loss, it's now on the endangered species list with just 1% of its original population remaining. Historically, the Carner Blue depended on ecological disturbances such as wildfires and uh, grazing by large mammals to keep vegetation in early stages of growth, which is what it needs to survive. So restoration efforts in places like Wisconsin try to mimic these effects by taking steps like prescribed burning or mowing to restore that habitat. Now remember that non-point source pollution is the primary cause of the, primary, or the harmful algal blooms discussed earlier in the presentation. And it's also one of the focuses or foci of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Our culture is responsible for the lion's share of total non-point source pollution, accounting for 61% of all phosphorus runoff into the Great Lakes. Another way to think about this is that the total U.S. portion of the Great Lakes Basin is about 174,000 square miles, which, I'm going to step away from the mic, is about everything south of the top border of the Great Lakes. Now, 37% of that land area is in some form of agricultural land use. And within that area, there are 126,000 farms in operation. Currently, about 10 to 20 percent of those farms are implementing some form of conservation agriculture. But we need 75 percent of farms to implement conservation ag to be reaching some of our water quality goals. Now, that seems like a big leap, but just five years ago, we had about half that many acres, half that many farms enrolled, and it's largely because of the uh, restoration initiative that we've doubled that uh, in the first phase of, of the program. So one large aspect of agriculture conservation is what we call the four R's of nutrient stewardship. And that's basically applying fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time, on the right place, and from the right source. But the other thing we need farmers to be doing is implementing conservation strategies that reduce runoff and erosion, such as no-till planting, planting cover crops, and installing buffer strips. I only have time to talk about the one strategy, buffer strips, but there are areas between croplands planted in permanent vegetation the urban analog to this would be the bioswell, which I'm, maybe some of you have heard about. And in both cases, they slow water runoff and trap sediment, fertilizers, and pesticides, as well as pathogens and heavy metals. Now, if properly installed and maintained, they, uh, buffer strips have the capacity to remove up to 50% of pesticides and nutrients. So the science behind nutrient conservation has already been largely established. The question now is, how do we get farmers to participate? Carl Juskovich is one of the farmers participating in one such agricultural conservation program. He's a farmer in Van Buren County in Michigan, and he says that though switching to conservation agriculture can be quite profitable in the long term, many farmers need economic incentives to make that often costly transition over. Traditionally, this is done through cost-share programs. However, pilot programs are currently being implemented on pay-for-performance strategies, um, which basically pay the farmer a certain amount for every uh, certain unity, or so, sorry, every certain unit of uh, erosion and runoff reduction. Now, like I said, these are pilot programs, so further re research is needed to, into the best way to quantify these um, sources. But that's exactly the type of research that the Great Lakes Rest Restoration Initiative supports. So in conclusion, problems like habitat degradation due to invasive species and non-point source pollution are too big for any one policy actor to solve on their own. We need to establish achievable environmental goals with input from folks 
in the Clark Township in Michigan, or farmers in Van Buren County, city dwellers in Chicago, Buffalo, and Detroit, state agencies, tribal communities, and small businesses alike. We need everyone doing their part, working at multiple levels of government and across policy sectors. The Great Lakes Ecological and Economic Protection Act of 2015 permanently establishes the Great Lakes Advisory Board and Interagency Task Force to perform this work and authorizes funding so that Great Lakes restoration can continue into the future. Thank you. I would love to take your questions. Thanks, that was a great presentation. Thank I just you. had a quick question on the exact on, on the exact type of agriculture used in these areas. I mean, I, I know you said that 61% of the phosphorus, um, the majority of the phosphorus comes from the farms, but could you elaborate more on what exactly these farms are producing and also possible ways to shift agriculture, maybe shifting to different crops? Right. So I can't give you the breakdown of crop-specific commodities that are coming out of these regions. I know that row crops are big, um, wheat's being produced, as well as animal agriculture like beef. Um, in terms of shifting agriculture, I don't know that we really require a change in what is grown, but how we grow it. So we can use strategies like buffer strips, for example, but there are other like um, double ditches and um, grass waterways that are going to soak up these nutrients. Um, the interesting thing about, we can, I guess the answer is we can produce a lot more environmental results with less impact and certainly less impact than having to transition to different forms of agriculture just by making our agriculture more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Danny. Great job. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you, you went over agriculture a lot, and it seems more rural areas. Are the pollutants of concern the same in urban areas? Or if not, what, what types of pollutants are they uh, trying to <clears throat> address in those areas? Right. So pollutants in urban areas are much the same when we're talking about non-point pollutants, like uh, runoff, basically because you're still getting fertilizers from lawns and um, things of that nature. Often in urban areas, you also have more heavy metal um, t um, contamination because of the industrial history there. Um, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of cleanup efforts through the restoration initiative in that area. Um, I focused on agriculture because it's something we haven't really talked about much this semester and happens to be an interest of mine. Um, but yeah, uh, to answer your question simply, yes, Phosphorus and nitrogen exist in urban areas from sewage and runoff, but also um, you have a lot of like toxic material, or um, sorry, heavy metals as well. You sound like an ecologist today, it's great. Um, <laughs> are all the Great Lakes affected equally by algal blooms? You know, they're all affected. I, the research, the literature talks a lot about Lake Erie in particular. Um, I know it's not the only lake that's affected, but it seems like Lake Erie is the most impacted, so maybe not equally. Yeah. Yeah, I want to know if the Canadians are, you know, doing such a great job as the Americans on... <laughs> controlling that input. Well, this initiative actually stems from a binational agreement um, made between the Canadians and uh, the Americans back in, team, can I have a reminder on the date? 1978? All right. So um, I don't know the specifics of their programs. I know that um, they are taking measures, and I also know that they probably, they may actually, um, well, Let's put it this way, a larger share of their agricultural produce comes from the Great Lakes Basin than in America. Only 7% of the food we produce comes from the Great Lakes Basin. 25% of Canada's uh, food comes from, was grown in the Great Lakes Basin.